Good morning. And welcome to First Baptist Church. We are so happy that you all are here today. And if you're at home, welcome, welcome. We are so glad that you are with us today. Well, coming up will be Thanksgiving. Before we know it, it will be Thanksgiving. And yes, COVID may change things. Things may look a little bit differently. But we are still having our Thanksgiving meal. And we invite you to join us. And so how does that look different? Well, We want you to reserve your spot online. We want you to register online. And why would we want that? Well, because this is gonna be a catered meal. So for the first time, you don't need to bring a side dish. And this meal will be catered 100% and it will be served to you instead of you going down the line buffet style. So we do ask that you sign up online and you can do that on our website, madisonfbc.org or downstairs at our kiosk. You can always call the office and if you need some help. So uh, we invite you to do that. And it, it is coming up. It'll be in November on Sunday the 15th. Also, today Randy is going to be talking about idols. He's going to tell a story in Exodus where, where Moses went up on a mountain to pray and talk to God and the people got restless They got restless, and they, well, God was taking too long. So they wanted someone to lead them and for them to follow, and so they created their own idol. They made it with their own hands, and it was pretty. It was pretty. They made it with their own hands. They could see it. They could touch it, and it was a golden calf. And we may think that's really weird, but... But we still create our own idols. Idols that, because we want to see something face to face. We want something with our own hands. I remember when I was very young, I was hyper and I had lots of energy. I know that's really hard to imagine, but I loved doing things. I was very, very busy. And in fact, I, I held my calendar of high esteem, and, and I felt good about myself because I could do lots of things, and do them well, actually. I, I was very proud of that at that time. Well, my health got stripped away, 100%. My health got stripped away. I could do nothing for months and months and months. I could do nothing, and, and I thought, well, what good am I? Where, where's my value? Where's my worth? If I can't do these things that are on my calendar, well, God showed me that all of those things were idols. I put my calendar before him. I put my busyness, my, my own, the things that I did with my own hands, I, I put before him, and they were stripped away. And he showed me that my value was not in him, not in in the things that I do, but really is who I am. And who am I? I'm a child of the living God. And so as we go today through our worship service, I invite you to reflect on, is there something that I am putting before him? If my value is not 100% in him, then it's probably got a little bit of something else in there, and, and we don't want that. We want him to be 100% where our value comes from. And I just invite you to reflect on that, think on that. Is there anything that is in your life that, that you're putting before him? And he showed me that during that time that when I was sick, I had the sila. And in Psalms 46 and 47, you can read through scripture, and there's a word that just gets stuck in there, and it's called sila, S-E-L-A-H. And he showed me that during that time, it, it was put in scripture to stop, for you to stop, pause, and reflect on what God is doing What is he doing? What has he done? And so during this worship service, you don't have anything else to do just to sit and reflect and pause and think about what God has done and what he's doing in your life. So may this be your Selah. Shall we pray together? Now, Father, we come to you this morning. We need a, a big God. Uh, God that's stronger than sticks and stones. A God that's even stronger than gold. A God that can be everywhere and can be with us each day. 
We come to you to worship you this morning because you are that God that we have found and we are satisfied with you and our prayer is that you be satisfied with us. We thank you for all the good things that you've done for us in this church. You've blessed us throughout the years. You've kept us together. You've kept us strong. You've helped us witness. You've told us the way to go and we want to lean out upon you in the future to know the direction, where you want us to go, what you, what you want us to do. We want to please you, God. That's why we're here. We'll hold up your name on high this morning. We worship you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please join me now in the hymn, Come Thou Almighty King. As we continue worshiping together as a community this morning, we want to take some time to pray together, to pray for those things that are on our hearts that are stressing us out, but also to pray for those things that have been a blessing in our lives. So as we come to this moment, if you're online, I encourage you to comment in the comment sections. And then if, if you are here in the room with us, would you mind shouting out your prayer requests or praise this morning? Okay, so Bill had more testing done on his mar marrow, but they, and they're still trying to figure out what he has. Yeah, okay? Helen Smith is turning 95 and she appreciates cards. Psalm 82.3 was able to successfully open their first house and have girls start there, yes? Okay. Anyone else? Will you pray with me? God, we come to you knowing that you were present at the beginning of time and that you have been present with us throughout, throughout eternity. And as we come to this moment this morning, Lord, we acknowledge your presence 
and your power and your rule over this world. And we just ask that the things that are on our hearts, those things um, that people may not feel comfortable lifting up, that they're struggling with, we pray that you would help to take those, that we would trust you with the things that we're struggling with. But also, Lord, we come to you celebrating all of the many things that you're doing in our world today. And so as we come to this moment, we want to give you the glory for all of that, all of the blessing in our lives, even the breath that we breathe is because of you. And so as we come to this moment, Lord, we ask that you would help us to worship you, to pour out our worship to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please join me now in the hymn, I'd Rather Have Jesus. Lord, we're so thankful, thankful for so much that you've given us. All that we have is truly yours, and they're given to us simply to be stewards of. Father, help us to return a portion of what you've been so uh, generous to us with, and to help us to give cheerfully and happily and to the work of thy kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. I wasn't exactly sure how to set up this song that we're getting ready to sing, but after that last song, I now know. Is that coming through okay? Verse 2 really struck me of I'd rather have Jesus. It says, I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. And I'd rather be true to his holy name. I think we would all agree that that's what we would rather have, but is that what we do? It's great to have goals that we would rather place our hand in his nail-pierced hand and walk with him every single day, but having a goal and accomplishing that goal are two different things, and the fact of the matter is we're all the same. We are all like sheep who have have gone astray from time to time, maybe even once a day if we were honest with ourselves. But he has never left us. He's never forsaken us. He's always been faithful. When we have been unfaithful, he has been faithful. And if we can kind of look back over our lives and seeing the things that we've gone through, maybe we handled them properly. Maybe we had our hand in his nail-pierced hand through some of the struggles and trials that we've gone through. And and maybe there are times we can look back, if you're like me, you can look back and see times I let go of his hand, and I did it my way. Ask me how that worked out for me. It didn't work out very well. But yet he was faithful. And this is a song that Kelly and I are going to sing. It's called There Was Jesus, and it's a song about the faithfulness of Christ. And we can look back and see his faithfulness. And as we look back and see his faithfulness, may it encourage us more and more each day to take our relationship with him more seriously and to be faithful to him because he has been faithful to us. For this man in need, sorry, I've got the um, pages. I was singing verse three ahead of time. Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand and start to fall And all those lonely roads that I have traveled on Well, there was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground When the friends I had were nowhere to be found And I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now There was Jesus In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it or couldn't see it, there was Jesus. For this man who needs amazing kinds of grace, for forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay, Well, I'm not perfect, so I thank God every day. There was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment where I've been and where I'm going, Even when I didn't know it, I couldn't see it. There was Jesus on the mountain, in the valley. In the shadows of the alley. In the fire and the flood. Always is and always was. Alone. 
in the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it, I couldn't see it. There was Jesus. There Please join me now in the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Good morning. Thank you, music team, once again for leading us in worship this morning. As we sing these amazing songs again, and Kelly, as they come and, and gave us, as they are here and bringing special music to us, we so appreciate that. Wasn't that awesome? I didn't know that Kelly could sound like Dolly Parton so well. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> but as we worship this morning and the passage we're looking at, we're going into the Old Testament in Exodus. And here in this passage, 
Um, and we're looking around actually a lot in the middle and end of Exodus. I'll primarily be looking in um, chapter 32. But as we look deeply into this, we can see something that really tells us human nature and character and also God's character as we look deeply into this. And some background information. Remember, Moses led the people who were held in bondage in Egypt, the Israelite people, the Hebrew people. And he led them out, and he um, did amazing miracles as that happened. Crossing the Red Sea, the waters parted. They walked as dry, as on dry land as they crossed that. And they had a lot of adventures, and they were beginning to understand what it means to trust in God for what they needed every day. Whether it was food through manna or water as Moses struck a rock with his staff as God told him for water. So they were learning, theoretically, how to trust God for everything and all the basic necessities that they have. But more importantly, just understanding to trust God with their lives. And as they were traveling, they came to a point, the foot of Mount Sinai the mountain that many amazing thing happens in the Old Testament. But as we look, this is a place that people encounter God. And as they um, park there and begin camping around Mount Sinai, God um, called Moses up to the mountain to talk. And one of the things I found interesting, I'm, I'm reading through this passage and, and researching. Do you know how many times Moses went up and down the mountain? Seven times. Um, that it wasn't just one encounter getting the Ten Commandments. You know, as we look at, um, if you've seen Charlton Heston, I just remember like there's one trip up and one trip down. Maybe two, you know, broke the tablets once, went back and got another set. But as you look through, there were seven encounters um, between Moses and God on that mountain. And the first trip up, there's this proposal. God makes a proposal. And it's very similar to a proposal of marriage that we would have today. And we know, you know, now it's really, really cool to have a really cool proposal. And then you post it on Facebook or whatever and see that. And sorry, Lisa, it was, mine was not that dramatic. It was very simple, taking her to her favorite spot and um, pulling out a ring and asking her for marriage. But here is a proposal that God is making to the people. And it's an incredible proposal. God is committing himself to be God in a relationship with a group of people, with the Israelite people. And then their requirement is then to commit themselves to him in a permanent relationship, in a relationship where they will be a nation of priests. And this is very significant. It's not just a cozy thing between God and the Israelites because the priest is a representation of, during this time period between God and the people. And the priest is to let the people know who God is and what God says. And so this is an amazing thing. This is a covenant so that the people of Israel will be priests to the nations, so that the whole world can know. And God is wanting a special relationship with them so that the whole world can know who he is. And so this proposal is made, and then along with that, as Moses is coming down the mountain, God wants to speak to the people. And part of that covenant is that he gives the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 20, we have God here in um, not just bullet forms, but in paragraph form explaining the Ten Commandments. And so God explains these are the ways that I want you to covenant with me, and I want you to behave this way, and along with other commandments that he gives later. But these are the big ten. And as he's sharing these things, he's doing it in a verbal way so, so that all the people can hear. And it's like thunder as God is speaking to the people. And they're terrified. And actually, as God finishes, the people go to Moses and they request, don't do that again, please. This is terrifying. Why don't you just go talk to God and then you tell us what he says? Because just God's presence was too much for them. God's presence was too big too powerful, and this is a hint that the people want something a little more domesticated. They want God to be a little bit more tame than that, something more that they can manage and control, and not some, some God that's so big and powerful. And I think that's a little foreshadowing of, of what is to come. But as God is giving these commandments, 
Um, do you know what the first commandment is? The first commandment is, I'm your God, and you need to keep that clearly in your mind, and don't think anything else is God because I'm God. I don't want you to make any idols. I don't want you to make images that you're going to worship, anything on land or sea or anything. I'm your God. Worship me in truth and spirit. Don't make images to worship because I don't want un something unclear. That I don't want you to worship anything but me. And God says, I'm a jealous God. Now, um, I've recently learned that this Hebrew word implies great passion. A lot of times now in our modern ways of thinking of jealousy, a lot of times there's like kind of envy tied in with that. But this word, as it's used in Hebrew, it doesn't have that component. It's mainly, I'm passionate for you. You know, I am passionate for you and want a relationship with you. So it doesn't include that envy and those kind of things that we tie in jealousy today. So God is passionate for us and wants what's best for us. And when God says, I'm a jealous God, he wants you to be pursuing him for your benefit because he's passionate for you. Because if God is God, and if we choose to worship him in truth and in spirit, God is still God and God is great. And if we choose not to, God is still the same, great and powerful and awesome. But God is giving us the opportunity to come to him and worship. And that's the opportunity that he was giving the people. So as they continued on, um, they hear these words from God, and the, Moses discusses this with the leadership and with the people, and they agree. We accept God's proposal. And so, great. So the people are in agreement. They've seen the power of God. This is a big responsibility, but they say they're up to the task. And so then in 24 um, is Moses going back to God, going back up the mountain and saying, the people accept. We accept, and we're going to be your nation of priests. And so as they're having this conversation, God is great. He's saying this is wonderful. And then he begins this long, the next several chapters up to chapter 32, explaining how then this, what this is going to look like. He explain, explains the tabernacle, how God is going to be, have a visual presence with the people all the time, and how to build this tabernacle, which is a portable temple um, with this tent. And he's explaining how he's going to empower skilled craftsmen to make things so well. And he's describing how the priests who are a part of the temple are going to dress and all the rules and regulations to that in great detail as part of the covenant. Meanwhile, as the people who are newly engaged, they are still at the foot of the mountain day after day goes by because Moses at this trip up the mountain, he's up there 40 days. And they begin to get restless. And they're like, is Moses coming back? It's been 40 days. And to me, it's hard to understand that. Have they not learned patience over the time of understanding how God's working? They've seen these incredible miracles. They've seen God work through Moses in really powerful ways. And so let's key in here in Exodus 32. And here the people are beginning to show their frustration and their lack of patience with the incredible thing that God has for them. And when the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Mayor Aaron. And now remember, Aaron is Moses' brother. And from the very beginning at the burning bush when God called Moses to deliver the people, um, as Moses had that conversation with God about that, Moses um, talks to God and they decide that Aaron's going to be his right-hand man. And he's going to be a voice for the people because Moses feels like Aaron's a better talker than what he is. So they're gathering around Aaron and they say, Come on, let us make some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses. And can you imagine the language? It's not like Moses. It's like this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So Aaron said... Take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. And one thing I think here, oh, well, the, the boys wear earrings just like the girls during this time period. So Moses is gathering these. And remember, there's a lot because when they left Egypt, 
the Egyptians were giving them lots of jewelry and gold and things. So there's a lot of, of gold here. So, and Aaron says, bring them to me. And all the people took their gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. And when Aaron took the gold, he melted it down and molded it into the shape of a calf. And when the people saw it, they exclaimed, O Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I'm like, how can you say that after you've seen what God has done? And then I look at my own life, and I recognize through times, um, through high school and college, when I felt like I was pursuing God all the time. But then when I go back and reflect, I see this area of my life that I didn't fully turn over to God, and this area of my life that I didn't fully turn over. And then I understand I'm as bad as they are. There are areas in my life that I'm so slow to turn over, things that I want to keep to myself and not turn over to God. So as horrible as I think there are, I really need to point that finger back to me and look at, you know, many ways I'm just like them. And then, as I was studying and reading through this passage, I caught something that I've not really caught before, and that's Aaron. And I think this is really, really important. Aaron saw how excited the people were. So he built an altar in front of the calf, and then he announced, tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. And I'm like, what? You just built a calf. And then I'm, and this is to the Lord. This is in your Bible, it's all capitals, L-O-R-D. So he's being clear, this is Yahweh. So he's going to have a festival to Yahweh, to God Almighty, who has led them out of Egypt with the golden calf. And now I'm really confused. And then I begin to understand, not only are the people confused and they're wanting something else to worship, but in Aaron's mind, he's worshiping God. He's worshiping Yahweh even though he built the calf. And so I'm like, what's going on there? And I realize, oh yeah. You see, when we come to worship our Savior, when we come to worship the Lord of the universe who created everything, it's impossible for us to fully comprehend the majesty and the greatness of who God is. And so we do the best that our little feeble mind can do. But it's very important that we're always learning and growing and allow ourselves to really understand how powerful and who God is and that we're growing in that understanding every day. Because we're always, I think, off a little bit because of our own shortcomings and our own humanity. So I think our goal should be is to continually growing and being in God's Word so that the, the image that we have of who God is is the most accurate one that we can possibly have. I remember when we were blessed about a year ago or so um, that I got a, a message from a friend in town who had another friend, and he was a recent convert to Christianity from Islam. And he felt led to speak and talk about that because it made such a huge impact on his life, and he came and spoke here on a Sunday night. And I asked him a question because I was curious about this. I said, is the God that you worshipped before your conversion, how is he different or is he the same God or a different God than who you wor worship now as a Christian? Are you just having a better understanding of who God is? And I was curious, like, how did he frame that in his own mind? And if I remember correctly, um, he hadn't thought about that. And so it wasn't really, it was fuzzy in how he was putting that together in his mind. And I give him credit that um, we're all growing and learning about how to do things. But that's a question I want for all of us this morning. Is the God that you're worshiping, is it the God who's presented in God's word? Or is the image of God that you're working something that you've created out of your own mind? 
and out of your own mindset rather than who God really is. And the fact is that studies have been done looking at this very thing. In fact, I just saw yesterday there was an article that said, and I don't know if it's accurate or not, but it was saying that 30% of those who consider themselves an evangelical Christian do not believe that Jesus was deity, that Jesus was God. I'm like, wow. And then years ago, about a decade ago, there was a group out of Princeton um, Seminary who they did a study, and they found that the majority of people, their beliefs about who God is, how God operates, God's character, the way that God relates to us was not what was presented in God's Word. And that we have created our own God from what we've learned out of pop culture because they're saying that most people who go to church and attend church aren't reading their Bibles anymore. And so we've just let ourselves absorb an understanding of who God is from culture rather than the scriptures that God has given us. And I want to talk about that a little bit. And as, as I do, I want you to think about, is that the way I think of God? And let's compare that to who God is in the scriptures. So here's what this group found, that the majority of people who in our country, who they say they believe in God, and even including those who go to church, think about who God is. It's, there's three points. One is that God wants you to be good. God wants you to be good. And this means that God wants you to have good moral behavior. God wants you to be a person, when you look at the good things that you do and the bad things that you do, that you have more good things in your life than you have bad things in your life. And that's not biblical because God calls us to holy living. God calls us to be pursuing his holiness and not just that our good deeds outweigh our bad deeds. Does that make sense? God calls us to be his people, a chosen people, to proclaim his love to the nations. And in doing so, he, doesn't, he wants more from us than just basic morality. And Jesus clarifies this in his teachings when he says, you know, you've heard that you should not commit adultery. I say that you shouldn't lust. You've heard you should not commit murder. I say that you shouldn't be angry with your brother or sister. So there's an understanding here that God calls us to, to holiness, not just a simple morality. So that's the first one, is that your good deeds should outweigh your bad deeds, of this new understanding that is incorrect of who God is. The second point is that God wants you happy. So God is there so that your happiness is supreme. So that means whenever um, something bad happens to us, which it always does because we live in a broken world, that God's upset about that and God wants you to be happy and God really wants to fix that in your life. And the truth of it is, in Scripture, God is calling us to pursue him with everything that we've got. God is calling us to do whatever it takes. Were the disciples happy as they pursued Jesus and they were, tradition says that they were all killed except for John in their pursuit of holiness and pursuit of what God was calling them to do. It's so easy to think that as a Christian, Whenever we pursue Jesus, everything just flows into place and everything's hunky-dory all the time. We have perfect health. We'll have plenty of money. And that's not biblical because God is calling us to be all missionaries, to be who God calls us to be. God is calling us to give up things, to pursue who he is and what he is wanting us to do. That's supremely important. Now, it doesn't say we won't have joy in our lives from pursuing that. But it doesn't mean that we'll always be happy. It means that we will always have joy. And there's a difference in that. And then the third thing is that God, in this wrong understanding of who God is, is that God is always distant. 
until you need him. And this understanding excuses us from having a daily relationship with God because God's just way out there somewhere and God is up there in the heavens and then when we need something though and then we pray to God then God's not distant and then God comes down to make us happy and then so that's the third point is that God is distant until you need him and then when you pray to him he'll come and make us happy and you can see when a person wrongly has these three views of God and they say this is the dominant view of Americans of understanding who God is is that what happens when life hits and something tragic happens in our lives and then we pray and then the problem doesn't go away then what people are doing is like wow God doesn't exist God's not there I need to move on. I need to make a golden calf. So it's so important that we recognize that culture teaches us wrongly who God is. And then when we have this information from culture, we can make our own golden calf. And I'm afraid that's what we're doing, and myself that I'm doing, and that we're all doing, is that we are making our own image of God something that's domesticated, something that's safe, something that doesn't call us to extreme action. So we want to worship a domesticated God, someone who we can control and we tell what to do. That's the golden calf. And am I worshiping a golden calf? Are you worshiping a golden calf? Are you worshiping an image of God that's safe and simple? and easy to understand. How can you tell that? Here's one way that we can tell. What do you pray? When you do talk to God, what are the words that come out of your mouth? What are the words that you're communicating to God? Are your prayers simply a list of things that you want and need? Then you're fitting in this, this new model of what people believe. Are we praying, God, I, I need this, and I need this, and this hurts, and my friends have these needs, and we need to help them and pray for them. And if that's all that your prayer life is, then maybe your understanding of God is too much focused on your happiness and other people's happiness. You see, our prayer life is an indication of, of what we believe about God. Just like your conversations with other people tell you what you think of the other person. So your conversations with your spouse or with your kids or with your friends, co-workers at work, they tell you what you think about that other person. They tell you what's in your mind. And you may not always say what you think. But it's a good indication. If someone is eye-rolling when you're always talking to another person, if someone is um, speaking things and, and making fun of the other person, or you're always condescending and talking to the other person, that indicates what you think about that person and the ideas that they have. The same way when we pray to God. Are you praying to God when you pray? Do you say, God, you are amazing. God, you are so holy and everything I want to that I do, I want to glorify who you are and praise your holy name? Do you have prayers that say those things to indicate that God is powerful and amazing? When you pray things, are you concerned about, God, am I pursuing what you want me to do today? God, are you, when I get out of bed today, when I am talking to people at work or when I'm going to the store, God, use me for who you call me to be. God, are there things in my character that are messed up? God, I want you to show me things in my character that are wrong, that are messed up, where I need to turn things over to you. Are those the kind of things that you're praying? Are you praying simply a, a laundry list of things and needs and wants? Those things indicate that. So I want to encourage you, look at your prayers and think about what am I praying? Why am I praying it? Am I praying to Yahweh of God's word? Or am I praying to a golden calf that I've just made up from pop culture information? It's a very, very important thing to look at. Also, for us then to understand who we need to be praying to, 
you really have to know who God is in God's Word. And how do we do that? One, you read it yourself. Very, very important. And I've talked about that a lot. But right now I want to talk about how important it is to read God's Word in community. Reading it with friends and coming together and getting a bigger understanding of, of who God is. God's Word was created, and as it was created, it was meant to be read in community. Because they didn't have books like we have now. So it was very oral. And stories were shared in groups. And even in the time of Jesus, you know, they had scrolls that were very expensive to make. So you would go to temple, to synagogue. You would go to a group and hear God's Word read together. And people memorized it together and people studied it together. Because they didn't have availability to have that, you know, in their home when they went home at the end of the day. So it was written to be done in community. And right now I want to say to you that reading God's Word in community with other people is critically important. And we have lots of opportunities within our church family to do that. We have connection groups that meet Sunday morning. And that is Jerry's teaching a class and Grover's teaching a class. And those are available for people to come to to study God's Word in community. And it's really important that all of us are part of a group. And then we have groups that study God's Word in the evenings during the week as well. And I want to briefly just let you know about these. And we have some new ones starting, and this is a great time to get started. On our, our webpage at madisonfbc.org, and downstairs there's a kiosk, and someone will be down there after worship. But let me briefly explain these other groups. So Monday night, the um, whites are hosting at the Parsonage, and they're hosting a group, and they are going to be studying God's Word together. And Eric is leading at the church on Tuesday nights, a connection group, and you're invited to come to that. And Wednesday night, I'm also at church leading a connection group, and you're invited to come to that. Now, each of these connection groups will be studying God's Word together, and it will reflect what's presented on Sunday morning during the worship service. They won't be identical, but they will reflect together so that we can be growing as a community together about the true nature of who God is. And during this season, as we are in God's Word, we'll be going through Old Testament passages because that's a foundation of who Christ is and Christ's teachings. So we'll be going through the Old Testament as we do that. Now, also, there's other supplemental groups that we also have. And they won't be a connection group like these others. What makes the difference between a connection group that I just talked about and some of the other groups is the connection groups are focusing on accountability with each other too. And they're focusing on caring for each other because of being in part of that group. And I'll say that the Seekers is a wonderful example of a class that's been doing that. As the group is bonded, they do things, they send cards to each other, they keep track of what's going on in each other's lives, they support each other and nurture that. And that's the, the point of that group is they study God's Word together, they're living life together, and then they can use God's Word as part of their lives. An amazing thing. The other connection groups will be doing that as well. Now, other groups that are going on that aren't a connection group, there are educational opportunities to learn God's Word, and I'm calling them supplemental because I think everyone needs to be in a connection group. But if you want to go um, in ways that are even more, but not connected to a connection group, then Sunday night, for example, the first Sunday in November, what I'm teaching, I'm going to do the Old Testament survey. And as someone comes to that, you'll be learning about, in, in detail at a, a, a college level, God's Word, and that group that meets on Sunday night, we will be really digging into God's Word in that way, but we won't be responsible for each other. It'll be more like going to a class. And a connection group is a lot deeper than that and, and deeper importance to that. So currently most of the people who attend my Sunday night class also go to other 
connection groups where that happens. Now, also, currently right now, Stephanie Grow is teaching a class on Thursdays, and she's studying the book of Revelation. And you're all invited to that. And as they come and learn, they're not doing that commitment to each other during that time period. It'll be happening for a long time as they're slowly going through the book of Revelation. So, what I'm encouraging you to do this morning is to prayerfully consider, am I studying God's Word in community with people? And if you're not, I am strongly encouraging you to look at joining one of these connection groups and connect and learn God's Word together because there's incredible benefit to that because, you know, God may inspire you something about God's Word that you can actually share with the group, that you can share with the teacher. You could teach Jerry something. Jerry's been learning and and teaching for a long time, but he still learns from pupils, from what they say. And they'll say something about God's Word. So your connection in a connection group is not just for your benefit. The group is missing out on something if you're not in it and you're not part of it because God's Word is made for us to study together as a group. So, and recognize the reason I want us all in a connection group is because I don't want us worshiping a golden calf out of ignorance. Because we need to be connecting in God's Word so that we get a clearer understanding of who God is. And so I really, really want you to consider a connect. Did I say that? To be in a connection group. So you can come ask me um, afterwards for more information. You can go to our website, as I mentioned. There's a kiosk downstairs that someone will be there. You can call the office and ask India about um, when do groups meet or how do I sign up for a group. Um, but we want to make this available for you to connect to something that's very powerful, and that is reading God's Word in community. So as we um, close this worship service, um, prayerfully consider that. I have a couple questions for us to think about. In what ways are you learning the true nature of God? And what that means is I want you to really ask yourself, How am I digging into God's Word myself right now? Am I personally doing my own study? Am I involved in a group of people where we're studying God's Word together? And then say, God, what do you want me to do? What do I need to do now? And the second one, if someone examined the words you pray, what would they say that you thought about God? And keep this mindset with you, you know, all week as you're praying and thinking, what are the words coming out of my mouth And what does that tell me that I believe about God? So as we look at this point in our worship service, as Linda is going to um, play, it's an opportunity to listen to God. To listen to God's Spirit speaking to you. And I just pray, listen. Listen as this music is playing. And you're free, you're dismissed at any time during the music or afterwards as we worship together. I will be sitting over there, and if you have any questions about anything, if you want to pray about something, if you want to join our church family, you're invited. If you just want to talk about God and have questions about who God is, you're invited to come up, and I would love to chat with you about that. And if you want to sign up and you're intimidated by doing something online, um, Josh is downstairs at the kiosk and can help you um, figure out things and about connection groups and what that means as we um, close this worship service. Also, there's Grover Sunday School class and um, the Seekers class will be meeting after the service. You're welcome to just walk on down and say hello and they'll warmly greet you into their class. Let's pray. God, as we recognize you're calling us to something big. Um, God, you're not a, a golden calf that we can put in a box. God, you are the creator of the universe. So God, as we worship you this morning, teach us who we need to be and teach us who you are so that when we worship, we're worshiping the bona fide, authentic creator of the universe, Yahweh. God, may our image of who you are be very accurate as we learn who you are from your word. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.